want to finish up section 4.3 on linearly independence. Um, we'll finish this section and then look at the next section. Uh, <clears throat> we had introduced on before the definitions for linearly independent and linearly dependent sets. As we go through this talk today, I will better clarify how that actually looks like. Um, and so uh, we look at the definition, uh, we wanna see if we can make the definition talk, make the definition talk. So that, that's our, our goal. Here's the very neat theorem um, that we're given. Um, we had made mention of it on before, uh, but again, I think it's useful that if you have a set of vectors, we call this set S, it's some set in a vector space. The question is, does this set S, does it span the entire vector space? Now, what does that mean? A spanning set simply says that I can take those few vectors here, R vectors, and I can produce any vector out in the big space Rn. It spans, it can produce. Uh, by a certain linear combination, I can produce any vector I want to get uh, out there in the space. So, and then secondly, uh, does this set S, does it form a linearly independent set? That means that are these individual vectors, do they stand alone? In other words, I cannot take any other vector within this set S to produce that other vector right next to it. So I can't take V sub two and write it as a linear combination of uh, vectors V1, V3, V4 to VR. I can't do that. The vectors are set to stand alone, okay? They are independent. So this is a very neat theorem that says that if the number of vectors in S, if it outweighs what the vector space allows in terms of the n-tuple number, so if R is bigger than N, then we say that here S is linearly dependent. And then the next one, if uh, R is less than N, then how can uh, S, which has R vectors, how can it span this N-tuple space for the Euclidean space of Rn? If S contains at least two vectors that are scalar multiples of each other, that scalar multiples means that I can take a vector and I can write it as a multiple of another vector. <coughs> well, that defines linearly dependent, right? If I can take something and write it as something else, then here the set S is said to be linearly dependent. Now, I'm going to give you some good examples, and I have them already coded here in this lecture, so that as I go through, then I will refer back to the definition for linearly independence. I refer back to the definition for linearly um, uh, independence. I'm going to refer back to these definitions to see if we can uh, uh, make sense of what they mean. So now let's begin. The Warren scheme, we made mention of that. We'll use that in this uh, talk today. In terms of if you're given functions, you want to determine whether or not the functions are linearly independent. We use the Warren scheme. So the one scheme is no more than just a determinant of here the terms inside of this matrix for the determinant are the functions. And so each column represents a function and below it, it's derivatives in ascending order. So the first function is first derivative up, up under that, second derivative all the way to n minus one derivatives. Why n minus one? n minus one coupled with the functions would still give you an n by n matrix or determinant, so it's still square. If that determinant is non-zero, then we say that the set of functions serve as a linearly independent set. If the determinant here for the Warren scheme is equal to zero, then we have linearly uh, uh, dependence. Okay. Kind of ran through some of the um, first few problems there. Uh, on yesterday. That's good. Let's move on and I'm going to tie in this same talk with the, uh, the next uh, set of problems. Here it says 
in each part, determine whether or not uh, the vectors are linearly independent or linearly dependent. Now, for these problems, you will need your graphing calculator. So the question is, determine whether or not these functions are linearly independent or linearly dependent. To show anything, you go to the definition of what is being sought after. Well, here, we use and apply the definition for linearly independent. Now, what does it say? You have to know it. Especially on the test, you have to be able to say it verbatim of how we've given it. That, that definition says that the set of vectors v1, v2, and so on to, uh, say for example, v sub n, uh, it could be v sub r, it doesn't matter about the subscript, are said to be linearly independent if there exists scalars, k1, k2, all the way to k sub n, whatever the number of vectors you have, such that the linear combination of those vectors with those scalars, k1 times v sub 1, plus k2 times v sub 2, plus and so on, plus k sub n times v sub n is equal to 0, implies that k1 equal to k2 equal to and so on, equal to kn, that equals to 0. That's linearly independent, that the vector stand alone. Right. If that's the case, then you know that the set here of given three vectors are linearly independent. If not, if the scalars are not all zero, linearly dependent. I'm going to show you what that means. It's always good to be able to answer the question, what does that really mean? Okay. So, So here, to show that the, the given three vectors, I'm going to just give them name V1, like it happens, it does that every first start on Monday. Give this name V1, call this V sub 2, call this V sub 3 to show that V1, V2, and V3 are linearly independent. We must show that there exist scalars k1 comma k2 comma k3 such that let's see that such that K1 times V1 plus K2 times V sub 2 plus K sub 3 times V sub 3 equals to 0. That's, that's, not, the, that's not the end of it. It's really still part of the, the, uh, the premise. Implies that K1 equals to K sub 2 equals to K sub 3, and they're all 0. If I don't get all those scalars to be 0, then we say that uh, v1, v2, v3 are linearly dependent. Right. Now, you, you remember last week I told you that the vectors naturally want to stand up? You remember that I said that? Vectors naturally want to stand up because vectors are men, and men want to stand up. A man ought to want to stand up. Okay? So, how is that? Well, let me write out, just take a moment. This is k1 times v1. v1 is negative 3, 0, 4, plus k sub 2 times v sub 2. That's 5, negative 1, and 2. Plus k sub 3 times v sub 1, v sub 3, excuse me, 1, 1, 3. That's equal to 0. What's that 0? It's this 0 here, right? Matter of fact, I've just written 
just rewritten this statement here, right here. That zero is there. All right. I'm going to show you what happens. And you'll see how these vectors want to stand up all by themselves. If you write this out, this is negative 3 times k sub 1 plus 5 times k sub 2. I'm just going right across. Plus 1 times k sub 3 is equal to 0. Do the next, the next uh, row. That's 0 times k sub 1 minus 1 times k sub 2 or minus k sub 2 plus k sub 3 is equal to 0. This is now 4 times k sub 1 plus 2 times k sub 2 plus 3 times k sub 3 is equal to 0. Now interpret that in terms of a, um, a matrix. Do you see what you have? This is negative 3, 0, 4. This is 5, negative 1, 2. This is 1, 1, 3. Here this is 0, 0, 0. Look at the columns. The columns represent V1, V2, V3. They naturally stand up because they're men, right? When I was down living on the farm with my grandparents and granddaddy would come in the room, 4.35 o'clock in the morning, tell my brother and I, y'all get up. <laughs> I don't know anything about military, but I tell you what, I know something about working on that farm down in South Alabama. Let me tell you something, brothers. It was rough. You know, and I thank the Lord for it every day right now. Until y'all get on up. We got these hogs to deal with out here. We got these cows to deal with. Y'all get on up. We had to go we cut wood or whatever. We didn't have we didn't have a, uh, you know, uh, electric heat, nothing like that, man. We had to go cut wood and that I mean, you know, some people today that's a luxury, you know, with a fireplace. Man, it was just a way of life for us, you know. And it wasn't nothing luxurious about that either. But let me tell you, man, he'll come in that room. Y'all get up. You know, an old man tell you, you a man, you got to get up now. But we're sleeping, granddaddy. <laughs> you sleep when it's nighttime. I thought it was still night, 4.35 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, he says, it's time to get up. Man wanna, ought to want to stand up. Okay, anyway, you solve this system here. I put it in my graph and calculate already. Here's what I got. This implies that K1, this is, look, let me, let me say that what this is. This implies this is 1 times K1 that's equal to 0. This is 1 times K sub 2 that's equal to 0. This is 1 times K sub 3 that's equal to 0. You have mimicked and worked through the definition for linearly independence. Yes, sir. Wouldn't that always be the case? Like, you just look at it and say, no. No. No, it's not always going to be the case. And I'll show you an example where it won't always be the case. So I wish we could just look at the system and say, okay, I'm going to get, you know, the trivial solution. Not necessarily. Why not? Because it's possible that the solution can be infinitely many. If it's infinitely many, you don't get all zero, right? If it's infinitely many, then you get linearly dependent. I'll show you that. We got a problem just like that in just a few minutes. Okay. So the neat thing here is that in the beginning of the course, all we were doing and dealing with was stuff like this, right? We were solving by uh, row reduced echelon form, solve this system. Well, here's one reason why we were doing that was because we we're trying to beg one question is uh, uh, do these vectors you didn't know that they were vectors you just thought that they were just just some system but do these vectors form a linearly independent set hmm? so here since they're all zero then the implication here is that these vectors are indeed linearly independent see that you see, the, in the argument for the, for the definition for linear independence, the key is on the conclusion. 
if the linear combination of K1 times V1 plus and so on, K sub uh, uh, N times V sub N equal to zero, does that imply, does that imply that all of the scalars are zero? That's important. If I have this conclusion, you conclude then linear independence. If I do not get this conclusion, you can't say it's linearly independent. It's going to either be, it's a bifurcation. It's either going to be linearly dependent or linearly independent. And, and, and look, grown-ups as well as my kids in children's church, they, they know how to answer questions like if it's either this or that, you know, and the kids, they get excited because I ask them, you know, did, did Moses do this? And they answer, they give a question, they give an answer, they say yes. And I say, come again. They'll say, no, and everybody gets it right, you know, because, you know, you know, it's either this or that, so it's not difficult, right? It's the same thing here. It's either going to be, if I ask you, is this linearly, end up, uh, if I say, this linearly dependent, you say yes, and I say, huh? He said, it's linearly independent. Well, you didn't have much thought on that, but you know it's bifurcation, so it's either this or the other. <clears throat> so we can eventually all sound pretty smart. <laughs> hey, boy. Okay, I had a funny story, but I got to move on. I got so much to cover. Let's look at this next problem right here. So here I have four vectors, V1, V2, V3, and V4. To show linearly independence, we must find scalars K1, K2, K3, and K4, because I have four vectors, such that the linear combination of these vectors equal to zero implies that K1 equals to K2 equals to K3 equals to K4, they're all zero, right? So what I have here is K1 times the first vector. I told you they stand up. Negative 2, 0, 1 plus K sub 2, 3, 2, Five plus k sub three six negative one one plus k sub four seven zero negative two is equal to zero. That is the matrix that we get is negative two zero one three two five. 6, negative 1, 1, 7, 0, negative 2. Yes, it's 0, 0, 0. Did you reduce that on your calculator already? Has anyone? On your graphing calculator, this is what you get. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Looking good there, 0, 0, 1. Well, looking good there, but here is the kicker. Negative 79 over 29, positive 3 over 29. 6 over 29. Oops. Now watch this. Here's what this implies. This is K1, 0, 0, minus 79 over 29 times K sub 4 equal to 0. This is K sub 2 plus 3 over 29 times K sub 4 equal to 0. This is K sub 3 plus 6 over 29 times K sub 4 equal to 0, where X sub, or K sub 4 would be the floating parameter, so that's going to be uh, equal to T. So this implies here. 
set k sub 4 equal to t. And so here, k sub 1 is 79 over 29t. I got x, I meant to say k, because those are the scalars here, k sub 1. 79 over 29 times t. K sub 2 is negative 3 over 29. K sub 3 is negative 6 over, this is times t by the way, each one is times t, excuse me, times t. Now my question is, are these four vectors, v1, v2, v3, and v4, are they linearly independent or linearly dependent? Dependent, why? Yes, true, and, hmm? Well, that, that is true too, and, I, and I'll make a comment on that. Pardon me? True, true, but but by the definition, these vectors are linearly dependent because what? That's right, all the scalars are not zero. K1 is equal to a number. It's equal to a lot of numbers because of that parameter t. K2 is a number, it's not zero. K3 is a number. It's not zero. I mean, it's zero, but then there's also infinitely other numbers as well besides zero. It's not fixed to be zero. K sub 4 is equal to some number, uh, and, and it's not just zero. What does the definition say for linearly uh, dependent? Look at it. It says here that a set of vectors, v1 to v, are are said to be linearly dependent if there exist scalars. Well, we found the scalars. They do exist, k1, k2, and so on, such that the linear combination equal to zero, we got that, implies not all the scalars are zero. Do you see that? Our scalars are not all zero, right? By definition, linearly dependent. And James is pretty crafty. He looked at the theorem, and he was finished already. He, he said, look, <laughs> he noticed that uh, we were in the, the three-tuple space. It was R3, but you had four vectors, right? V1, V2, V3, V4. Four is bigger than three. The set is linearly dependent. And I'm fine with that, too. You would say, in that regard, by the theorem, right? By the theorem. Since um, the number of vectors is larger then the, the three tuple or whatever the tuple space allows, we know by the theorem that these vectors are linearly dependent. And you're finished. But on the test, when I ask you to give the definition for linearly independence, give the definition for linearly independence, you can't use a theorem because I'm saying state the definition. Right? See that? But that's good, James. Yep, I would have used that as well, too. here by definition since not all not all scalars are zero The vectors are linearly dependent. Good.
Yes, sir. So is it safe to say that you're not given enough weight, that weight is for variable movements, and it's always going to be linear movements? Like, if you have four unknowns and three equations, you're not going to be able to solve those four equations. Right. Yes, sir. That's what that theorem says, yeah. that, that R is greater than, than N. It's always linearly uh, dependent, yes. Uh, and then the flip side of it, if, if R is less than N, then you can't span the vector space, so it, it won't be able to span. Now, why we talk about the two spanning linear indep linearly independence? Because if you have a set that, has, that meets both criteria, then those set of vectors form a basis, which is a skeleton framework for an entire system. So instead of looking at everything in the system, you just focus on on, on this framework right here. Like if you can, if, if, there, if there's a model type man that you can examine that represents all uh, aspects of mankind, instead of looking at all aspects of mankind, you focus on just that one person, that one, that, that one specimen. So that's what a basis is said to be. Um, and, and so scientists um, uh, are privy uh, to, in taking a random sampling, to focus on that one random sample as a representation of the whole. Right? And the idea here comes from the basis theorem uh, from uh, whether it's finite or infinite uh, uh, dimensional vector spaces. Um, so in other words, everything in life uh, has rich uh, theoretical uh, uh, foundation for mathematics. So here, Same type problem. So this is V1, V2, V3. V4. So to show that The vectors are linearly independent. We must show that if k1 times v1, if, I'm going to show that, excuse me, there exist these scalars, k1, k2, k3, k4, such that if k1 times v1 plus K2 times V2, plus K3 times V3, plus K4 times V4 equal to zero. Does that imply that K1 equals to K2 equals to K3 equals to K4 equal to zero? Well, we're not be able to see that. So here, you have K1 times the first vector, 3, 8, 7, negative 3, plus K2 times the second vector, 1, 5, 3, negative 1, plus K3 times the third vector, 2, negative 1, 2, and 6, plus K4 times 4, 2, 6, 4, That is, you put that in a system. We have 3, 8, 7, negative 3, or well, in the matrix form, excuse me. All right. 
on your graphing calculator. That's what I got. One zero 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 one zero 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 one zero 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 zero. Watch this. This implies that K1 is 0, K sub 2 is equal to 0, K sub 3 equal to 0. Uh oh, K sub 4, is it 0? It's T, it could be any real number. Linearly dependent. Not all the scalars are 0. You see that? Linearly dependent. Hmm. It's at part B, uh, let's see. Three zero, negative three six zero two three one. Okay, good. This one is yes. You take those uh, four vectors and you put those into the system. It reduces to the identity matrix. I want to check. I wrote something funny, but I said yes. But um, this does work out. Just use shorthand. The, the way that you're going to do it on the test is how the argument that I have here, but I want to cover uh, as much as possible today. This is 3, 0, negative 3, 6, 0, 2, 3, 1, 0, negative 2, negative 2, 0. But I can't give you the answers to even some of the ones that I don't work all the way out. You have to, if I ask, um, like this question here, uh, determine whether or not uh, the vectors are linearly independent or dependent. The argument, the way I'm giving it to you here, that's what I expect in terms of uh, uh, how you want to. Uh, no. Now, what if uh, the vectors are here uh, given as a polynomial? Still the same argument, uh, still the same method. Um, let me work one of these here. Okay. So this is going to be. V sub 1, this is V sub 2, V sub 3. Now, the number of vectors that the, the space of polynomials P2 allows is always said to be n plus 1 because the n factor represents the, um, the terms that have a variable with its power, but a polynomial, say for example, that is said to be of uh, the second degree, that is, that is highest term is the second power, it can have up, up to, at most, three terms in that polynomial. Right. Um, look at, for example, oh, this is V. Look at this guy. This, this is polynomial space uh, 
polynomials of, of second uh, uh, order. But it has three terms, right? Because you have this also this term here that's the constant, the constant term, which you're not really counting uh, as a variable. So it's this term here, v to the first, v, um, x to the first, x to the second. So this space allows for n plus 1. Here n is 2 plus 1, 3 terms, or 3 tuples. Three tuple just say space. Okay. So here to say that K one times V one plus K two times V two plus K three times V three equal to zero, does that imply K1 equal to K2 equal to K3 equal to K4 equal to 0? Well, that's the question for us to answer. So here, this is K1 times that first vector is going to be 2, negative 1, and 4. You're just pulling out the constant or the coefficients. Right? We call them coordinates to a vector. So V1 has coordinates 2, negative 1, 4. Sorry. <laughs> v sub 2 has coordinates 3, 6, and 2. V3 has coordinates 2, 10, and negative 4. The order is important. So if they're listed in ascending order, then all must be listed in that order. Or if they're listed in descending order, that's fine too, but they all must be listed in that order. Okay. So if you, if you start with the 4x squared minus x plus 2, that's fine, but list all the other vectors in that particular set in that same uh, uh, format and order. So here, k sub 2 times 3, 6, 2 plus k sub 3. So 2, 10, negative 4. I worked the problem out just so that I wouldn't have to be typing everything in on my calculator. Here, this reduces to the identity matrix. This does not work out. From first glance, why would you say that this is no? Too many variables, right? This space allows for three, right? Right. And I knew what you were talking about. This guy, the space here is the space of all. second degree polynomials, which here accounts for 2 plus 1 three tuple vectors, which this is fine. But here, according to that theorem, the theorem says that here if the space is, uh, for the vector space is 3, where here n is equal to 3, but r is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. r is equal to 4, right? 
since R is greater than N, this implies by the theorem linearly dependent. Yes, sir. So if it's greater, it is guaranteed to be Yes, sir. And if it's less than, it's guaranteed to be? No. If it's less than, it's guaranteed to not span the vector space. Okay. Just go back to that theorem. That's exactly what it says. Right. By using appropriate identities, determine which of the following sets of vectors uh, in the space of all uh, functions continuous functions on the, uh, the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity are linearly dependent. You can use the Warren scheme if you want, but it's very cumbersome. Because remember, the Warren scheme talks about if you have three vectors or three, uh, three functions, you have to find second derivatives, first derivative, second derivative. So you got that first derivative of three sine square x, which is a product and then the derivative of that expands out into a couple more terms, right? And same thing for that cosine square. You don't have to do that if you understand the definitions for linearly independence and the definition for linearly dependence. Let me show you. For the three functions to be linearly independent, we must find scalars K1, K2, and K3 such that K1 times 6 plus K2 times 3 sine square x plus K3 times cosine square x equals to 0. That has to imply that K1 is 0, K2 is 0, K3 is 0. Otherwise, otherwise, and what? Otherwise, if these scalars are not all 0, otherwise, uh, these uh, three functions are said to be linearly dependent. Well, watch this. Take K1 is equal to 1. K2, let's make this negative 1. K2 to equal to 2. And K3 to equal to 6. And this implies that negative 1 times 6 plus 2 times 3 sine square x plus 6 times cosine x, does that equal to 0? Because this is negative 6 plus 6 times sine square x plus cosine x. That's equal to 0. But not all the scalars are 0. So it's linearly dependent. This implies k1 is equal to negative 1. k2 is equal to 2. 
K3 is equal to 6. Not all. 0. This implies these functions are, I'll just say here, linearly dependent. Okay. I skip part B. Same argument for part C. Let's write it out. Let's, see. Let's give them some names, V1, V2, and V3. Watch how this guy works out. Pretty, pretty slick. At V1, just foil that out, whatever you call it from algebra. Is it foil? <laughs> anyway, just work it out, right? <laughs> so this is 9 minus 6x plus x squared. Sorry, keep forgetting about that crazy screen. Stop it. <gasps> V2 is, I'll write that in the order here. Negative 6x plus x squared. V3 is 5. So watch this. You say K1 times V1 plus K2 times V2 plus K3 times V3 equal to 0. Let's see what that is. This is K1 times V1. This is 9, negative 6, and 1 plus K2 times V sub 2 is going to be 0, negative 6, and 1, plus K3 times uh, V sub 3 is going to be 5, 0, and 0. Set that equal to the 0 uh, vector. Here that gives us 9, negative 6, 1, 0, negative 6, and 1, 5, 0, 0. Now when you solve for that, you get this. And just solve it on your graphing uh, calculator. This implies that you have 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and here I get 5 over 9, negative 5 over 9, and 0. Ah, that's backwards. That is backwards. Hmm. Make sure. Well, that's right. That's right. I thought I wrote the vectors here different than how I worked them out earlier, but that's fine. So here, that is, yep. Yeah, I get K, K1 is equal to negative 5 over 9 T. K sub 2 is 5 over 9 T. And then K sub 3 is equal to T. Well, since these scalars are not all zero, then you know automatically is these vectors here or these polynomials are linearly dependent. Let me show you why. Let me show you why. Right? Since the scalars are not all zero, The three functions or polynomials are by definition linearly dependent. As the old preacher in the church used to say, let's see. Let K sub 3, since K1 and K2 are 
uh, divisible by 9, let's sort of get rid of the fraction, like we teach in class from years ago. Let k sub 3 equal to 9. So then we get k sub 1 is equal to negative 5. k sub 2 is equal to 5, right? So if that's the case, let's put it all together. So we have, we have k sub 1, which is negative 5, times that first, uh, that first vector here, that's the 9 minus 6x plus x squared, minus 5, that's well, plus 5, k sub 2, times that second vector. We list that in descending order, negative 6x plus x squared. And then plus 9 times here, that last polynomial is just 5 over there. If, if the computer would just behave, kind of acts like my wife. Oh, I'm recording this. OK, she may hear that now. She, she didn't care much about listening to my lectures anyway, which kind of sounds like the house. But anyway, <laughs> but, <laughs> so this is, um, let's see, K3 is, uh, is 9 times that, that's 5 there. All right? Work that out. So this is negative 45 plus 30x minus 5x squared minus 30x plus 5x squared plus 45. Cancels out, cancels out, cancels out. That's equal to 0. That's the scalar, the linear combination of the scalars times the vectors here, functions, equal to 0, but not all the scalars are 0. The scalars we got was like 5, negative 5, and 9, which implies then that here the vectors or the polynomials are linearly dependent by definition. Right? Does it make sense now? Does it make more sense in terms of what that means? Here on the test, the, the same way, I will say, use the Warren scheme to show whether or not the set of vectors is linearly independent. Um, if I say use the Warren scheme, then I'm simply saying these polynomials are easier enough for you to use the Warren scheme and get the answer real quick. Notice for the previous couple problems, where we're really doing the same thing with functions, but there was no hint to use the Warren scheme because I wouldn't use the Warren scheme for that other stuff that I just got through doing. It's, those derivatives, it becomes a whole lot of work, you know? So here, the Warren scheme with respect to x, uh, we list the functions up top, and then below the first derivative, second derivative, first derivative, second derivative, first derivative, second derivative. Now I make it, I like to make it like this because if the determinant that you come up with for the matrix is a triangular matrix, then the determinant is just the entries multiplied along the main diagonal. So here, we get e to the x. Well, that's never equal to 0 for any value of x. For all x, that's real. So here, this implies that 1x and e to the x are linearly independent. The, the theorem for the Warren scheme says that if the Warren scheme comes out to be something that's not zero, then the functions are linearly independent. We get not equal to zero, so here linearly independent. Okay. Same thing happens uh, for that one too, and um, you can do that one on your own time. Any questions? <laughs>